And okay. if it will play nice with me. So excited to have you with us. And you should have your presenter screen pop up now. Leslie, thank you so much. Thanks for everybody on the phone and uh, listening in and, and watching and uh, excited to be here today. Leslie, can you see my screen okay? I can see it, yes. Well, let's get this rolling. Uh, thanks again for coming today. I know it's getting close to holidays. Everybody's getting ready to kind of wind down for that. But why not end the year with talking about SQL Server and SQL Server 2016? I'm Bob Ward. I am a principal architect for Microsoft in the what we call the data group, affectionately within that known as the SQL team, and specifically in a group called Tiger, the Tiger team. And uh, been, as talking to Leslie, I've been at Microsoft, and that's my 23rd year to be at Microsoft. Uh, I've seen a long evolution of what's happened with this product. And SQL Server 2016 brings some amazing functionality we're going to talk about today. Um, just a couple things here. A lot of people ask me, like, where's the deck? Uh, where's the demos? I love some of the stuff you showed. I want to get my hands on it immediately. Well, guess no. I got good news for you. If you go to ak.ms slash bobwardms, as shown on the slide there, the deck I'm showing you today and the demos are already up there right now. So you could go up even during the talk if you wanted to and actually see those those content. And and I encourage you, you to browse if there's other talks I've done on SQL Server that are sitting on that OneDrive site. Um, Leslie mentioned about questions. I'm sorry, we're, you know, we could probably take an hour going over questions on this topic, and there's so many people in, uh, listening in. So, And I'm serious about answering your questions. So I will create a blog post. Uh, you can find it on our popular blog, ak.ms slash bobsql, or just search for bobsql. Uh, in a search engine, I think you'll run into that blog. So I'll do that uh, for sure. Once I get all those questions, I'll go through all of them. If you go through that blog and don't find your question answered, I have no problem with you emailing me directly, bobward at microsoft.com. I'm one of those crazy people that love talking about SQL Server, so you feel, feel free to email me. Um, so let's talk about this uh, topic we're going to go over today about SQL Server 2016. It just runs faster. And, and the way to talk about it is, is to talk more about how we got here. I mean, why did we come up with this topic? A colleague of mine, Bob Dorr, kind of sounds like Bob Ward. In fact, he's my partner in crime for the Bob SQL blog. Uh, he and I worked together a few years ago uh, on taking a look at functionality in SQL Server 2016 uh, that we started to understand we're making a game-changing difference for SQL Server in making apps run faster with almost no changes. And we kind of tried to go back into the history of how do we get here? Why do we make some of these decisions? And it all has to do with a couple of things. First of all, it has to do with newer hardware. Customers running newer I.O. systems, networks, and really dense core CPUs, we were finding that the algorithms built into SQL Server 7.0 and forward weren't keeping up the pace with today's hardware environment. And how do we discover that? Through customer experience. It's through technical support cases. It's it's through benchmarks, it's through lab engagements with customers, uh, it's running our own benchmarks, it's uh, using tools like Exivet and Xperf to take a look at the deep layers of the SQL Server engine and finding out areas of improvement that we could make that we could keep up with today's hardware. And if you think about the themes here, it's all about scalability. It's all about making sure that if you're going to move to a higher end hardware system, that SQL Server can scale with your workload. And in fact, I've got a term I call reverse scalability. And that is, we were running into customers that would take the same workload, the same SQL Server, move to a higher power hardware, and they actually got worse scalability. So that's not good. And in many cases, when we take a look at those scenarios, we found out it was SQL Server causing the problem, not the hardware and not the actual application. And the techniques that we looked at and we used, and these themes you're going to see today in the talk, all deal with partitioning. You know, how do you partition things to make things scalable? A very common technique when you're talking about scale high-end software solutions. Running things more in parallel, and I'm not talking about parallel queries, I'm talking about looking at some of the core engine threads that run for SQL Server and deciding can we do things in parallel. In some cases, we decided just to do more of things or larger of things. One example that I won't cover today, but it's covered in the back of the deck, is, is LogWriter. LogWriter, a background thread, we just started doing testing and discovered that we could just add more LogWriters and get better performance. Dynamic response, we'll talk about an example of that today, where instead of actually partitioning things ahead of time, we actually react to a problem SQL is encountering dynamically, and before it becomes an actual true customer issue, making a decision to do partitioning so that things scale on the fly. You don't even know what's happening. It's an auto adjustment we make. And finally, plenty of opportunity and examples in the code where we just said, look, there's an algorithm we're using to do something that just needs to be better. Something that worked great in the late 90s, early 2000s, but something that needs to scale better today with 
uh, with newer hardware. And the exciting thing I I'm, I'm, uh, want to tell you today about this talk is that anything you're going to see today was not intentionally built as an enhancement for an addition of SQL Server. You may have seen we just announced with SQL Server 2016 SP1 for standard edition that we've lit up newer features like in-memory, uh, <clears throat> OLTP, and column store. But the enhancements we're talking about today don't even matter for that. Um, they work in all all editions. Now it could be a feature that we have is still only enterprise edition that we enhanced, but there's nothing intentionally that we did here you're going to see today that's just specific for a given edition of SQL Server. So before I go into those type of details, I do want to make sure, and I've seen customers when I present this before miss out, there are two important features for SQL Server that I think a lot of people are not taking advantage of. And these features happen to exist even before SQL 16, and that's column store indexes and in Roma LTP. So if you've got any type of warehousing application, any type of application doing large type of SQL queries, take a hard look at column store. 100x increased query performance is not something we just made up. We've actually seen that happen for many customers. If you've got an OLTP to OLTP based application, uh, take a look at in-room OLTP. SQL Server 2016 has certainly uh, removed some of the barriers of adoption from that technology in the past, and 30x increased throughput is very achievable with that technology. The other exciting thing is with SQL 16 is these technologies can be combined together in something we call hybrid transaction analytical processing or HTAP. So take a look at those fun features and functionalities. There are enhancements to those in 16 that we've done to make them faster, but these are things you can take a look at. I think they can make a large difference for you in your application. Well, this is the list, and it looks big. I mean, how are you going to cover that in an hour? Well, we're not. <laughs> we're going to pick certain ones of these to kind of talk about and kind of drill more into. And if you've ever seen my talks in the past before, I always love explaining how things work. And so as we go into something about what I'm going to talk about, I will talk more under the covers how it actually works. This actually represents all the blog posts we've done on this topic. And in fact, when you get this deck afterwards, anytime you see something in blue with an underline, that's a hyperlink. And I'm a big believer in that. So you can use this as reference information in the future to go through the deck, click on a link, and see more details behind it. And that link right there goes to all the blog posts we've done on this topic, and this is a list of all of them. So you can see a pretty long list by category of things we've done in SQL Server. And again, the premise is little or no app changes, move to SQL 16, and you're going to get a performance boost. So let's actually go into some of these. We think of just about core engine scalability. And what I mean by that is these are things we've done into the core of SQL Server that we think can make a difference for customers from with performance. The first one that comes to mind is automatic soft NUMA. This is something that could apply to anybody using a NUMA-based machine. If you think about hardware technologies from the past, uh, you know, I've been around long enough that in the early days, in the late 90s and mid-90s, I was just starting to see SMP machines that had eight CPUs. I thought in the late 90s when I got a hold of one of these servers of eight CPUs, it was the fastest thing I'd ever seen that I could run SQL on. And as this technology grew, uh, we started seeing bottleneck problems at the hardware level. And in fact, that's where NUMA came to be uh, born as a technology, the idea of com computers within computers. So as you move past this eight CPU, this magical eight layer, and you move to things like 32 CPUs, there were bottlenecks happening on things like the memory bus that uh, caused NUMA technologies to come along. Now, let's partition CPUs, give them their own local memory bus, and things can scale and run faster. And fortunately, SQL Server 2005 was designed in from the get-go, built in with NUMA-aware functionality. And so most of these NUMA designs, when they first came out, had no more than eight CPUs per these nodes. You know, a, a, something called a node is like these mini computers. So you'd get a, a NUMA uh, a machine with four NUMA nodes, each with eight CPUs, and life was good. But along comes dual-core and hyper-threading, and even multi-core now. And on the market now, you can even get CPUs, 24 plus cores, in a given processor. So now what we started observing is machines with NUMA nodes start to experience the same bottleneck as SMP machines within the node itself because this threshold of eight started getting exceeded. So if you've got a, a machine with four nodes, each with 24 cores per node, now you start seeing bottlenecks happen at the node level. And in fact, we would observe this with something called a spin lock, which is a particular type of functionality in SQL Server we use for concurrency. So spin locks wouldn't scale with these larger CPUs. In fact, you might start seeing this reverse scalability type concept in this environment. So in SQL 16, we made an interesting decision. We said to ourselves, why don't we inside SQL Server take a look at a hardware node configuration and virtual, in a way virtualize this 
uh, partition this from a SQL perspective so that SQL, when it schedules its threads, will look at nodes uh, in what we call soft NUMA perspective. And in fact, by default, it's on in 2016. So anytime we detect uh, a machine that has hardware nodes where it's greater than eight physical processors per node, we, we take hyper-threading out of the equation, we will actually do this partitioning algorithm to turn in X number of nodes from a hardware perspective into a larger number of nodes from a SQL perspective. We don't change the hardware configuration, it's just SQL's perspective of the hardware. And we believe, uh, and we've seen, code in the engine that benefits from NUMA partitioning will get a boost. Here's a small example. IOCP stands for IO Completion Port. That's a special background thread that handles the incoming packets for logins and queries and batches and things. So we, by default, we actually create one of those per node. Well, if we're doing soft NUMA, we'll actually get more of these, therefore, theoretically, get a boost in connectivity and batch throughput at the lowest levels of the, of the engine, simply because we have more of these workers. That's something that uses node partitioning. You'll see other examples today. Well, I'll talk about something that's partitioned by a node. And if we're using soft NUMA, we're going to have more nodes, therefore, we're going to have more scalability, because we have more uh, things partitioned at a more granular level. And in fact, here's some numbers. You're going to see in these slides today these green uh, shapes that show go up on the right-hand corner and they talk about some of the observations of numbers. Look at the bottom one. We can take workloads derived from some of our popular benchmarks, take the same SQL Server bits on 2016, take advantage of Autosoft NUMA on the same hardware and get a 25% increase in performance just because of the fact that SQL Server by default will partition things by nodes. So I have a lot of questions about how this works, so I thought you might find an interesting example of a, of a pictorial view. This is based on a machine I use in the Microsoft Labs often, and it's a four-socket, 18-core uh, machine. So there's 18 cores, one uh, socket is equal to one node. So using hyper-threaded, you get a total of 144 CPUs. And this is a pictorial representation of one node. So one memory node has 36 logical CPUs. And by the CPU numbering scheme I've got listed here. And it's important to look at the word core because the number zero and one from a logical perspective actually align together as one physical core. So when SQL 16 takes a look at this single hardware memory node, it will, as it starts up, partition this to something like the following. It will take a single memory node and turn it into four logical nodes from a SQL perspective. Now if you noticed here, it's taken 36 CPUs and, and turn it into nine CPUs per node. The reason the number nine is significant is because we try to actually do as best we can to divide up these CPUs as close to the number eight as possible. That's that magical threshold of partitioning. And so in this particular case, we've got to make it even. So since we have 36, we'll use nine on each one. If you look at the numbers of CPU, notice that it's not consecutive across these, and I'll explain this. First of all, 0 and 1 do not show up on the same node because we want to avoid, we want to avoid scheduling threads as much as possible uh, on the same node um, from the same uh, core. So 0 and 1 will show up actually on two different nodes. But also notice that 0 and 1 don't show up on consecutive nodes. So we'll take physical cores, these CPUs and physical cores, and we'll put them and not in sequential order because when we do parallel queries, things like parallel queries, we actually assign these parallel threads consecutively across these nodes. So as much as possible, you can see we're trying to get smart here. We're trying to avoid scheduling work on the same physical core to avoid any contention actually at the core level. Now, we can't avoid the fact that the hardware node of the memory node zero still exists in its current form. So we map these virtual nodes to a physical hardware node, memory node zero. And you can see this. In fact, I've got a very detailed blog post I just built last week that goes into the nitty gritties of what the error log looks like, what do the DMVs look like. We try to make sure that we, we ensure that any of these CPUs stay on their same hardware memory node to avoid any foreign memory access. So <clears throat> again, a good example of us making a default decision in SQL Server to partition, uh, again, here's that keyword partition, the work of SQL Server in a way that's smart, scalable, but yet it doesn't defeat the purpose of what was built into the actual hardware. So take a look at Autosoft NUMA. There's a blog post and a more detailed blog post on Bob SQL that you can read more about that. <clears throat> the next uh, topic is dynamic memory object. And you can see how this is going to go today. We're going to go kind of through a tour of some of these features that I've listed in the original appendix. Uh, the other thing about the talk you should know when you get the deck is that if there's any topic 
in that front agenda that I mentioned before that is not covered in a slide. You're like, hey, I want to know about multiple log writers. You didn't cover that. At the back of this deck, there's a section called bonus material. And in there is a slide for every single topic. So when you want to go back later and read more about reader writer locks and multiple log writers and things of that nature, there's a slide that's available for you to look at afterwards for each one of those. And if you have a question about those and you post this question about as you see those, we'll certainly make sure we'll put that into the, uh, the blog uh, uh, question and answer. So dynamic memory objects deal with a concept called C memthread weights. If you monitor SQL Server, you may be familiar with something called DMOS weight stats, or you'll see weight types in DM exec requests. And perhaps you've sometimes encountered something called C memthread weights. I'm wondering, what is a C memthread weight? Well, let me explain it. SQL Server, when it allocates memory, it has to allocate memory for things besides just the buffer pool. There are different types of data structures used for SQL Server purposes, things like connection memory, uh, various other types of t memory that are smaller in size than the buffer pool, but they're variable in size. So they're not fixed like an 8K page. And so since we've built this multi-threaded system, we don't just let every developer in SQL Server allocate memory their own way. We've built a structure and an infrastructure around allocating variable size memory in SQL Server. And if you're a Windows programmer, you might be familiar with a concept called a heap. So we've built something like a heap structure, a heap manager inside SQL Server. And just like the heap manager in Windows, when you have a multi-threaded program, there is overhead required to manage this heap. There are internal data structures to track what memory is allocated and deallocated and various types of things within your memory manager structure. So when you have anything like that, you've got to make sure that one thread does not destroy the internals of what another thread is doing to allocate and deallocate memory. Well, whenever you do something like that, you have to create some sort of concurrency mechanism to protect this. And hence, when multiple threads try to have to go after a similar memory object to allocate and deallocate, you might run into something called a C memthread weight. Well, as it turns out, we built the infrastructure in SQL Server for these memory objects that we can partition these memory structures by node or CPU. But we don't do it for everything by default because that would be a lot of overhead that's unnecessary. But here's what we found over the years. First of all, we had to put a trace flag in so that in some cases, if something was partitioned by node, we would promote it to this CPU partitioning. And then second of all, a customer would contact us and say, look, none of that worked for me. I still have a problem. And it's not my fault. I didn't create this C mem thread weight concept. What are you going to do about it? Well, we had to create a hotfix. And kind of got tired of that. You know, every year, creating a hotfix for a different type of memory object. And you know, the thinking was, there's got to be a better way to do this. And this was born in SQL 16, the concept of dynamic memory objects. And this is that dynamic response concept I talked about earlier in the, in, the, in the talk. And that is, we will detect whether we're getting C memthread weights at a very early stage. And if we determine that there is a C memthread weight occurring, we will automatically partition the memory object by node, and if necessary, partition it by CPU. And in fact, we have some interesting results to show you. In fact, let me flip over and actually show you a demo. I've got a couple, couple of demos actually show you today. So this, of course, is Management Studio. And uh, let me flip over here and show you this. This is something you can look at later when you have the demos. Uh, this is showing a particular memory object and by default showing that this is a memory object that is not created as partitioned, but you're going to see here this contention factor be something that we look at to decide whether we should partition it. Now, this functionality is so good that I have to introduce a trace flag that's undocumented just to turn off the feature and that's the only reason you'd ever use this, so that I don't, I don't actually see the problem happen so quickly, you don't see the behavior. I have perfmod running, and in perfmod I have a couple things. I have thread safe memory object weights. I have processor time for SQL and batch requests. So I have this workload that you can actually run yourself. Uh, it's a batch script that you'll see with the demos, and it's going to go kick off some work to go do a lot of memory allocations. And as you run that, you can kind of start to see the behavior of what some of this uh, looks like. You see the weights get really high, like 35,000 per second weights that are occurring. You see processor time pretty high. You see the green line of batch request at a certain rate. If I go over here and take a look at this DMV, I will see over here that I've got a contention factor. It's still not partitioned. If I go take a trace flag to turn on this, kind of like flipping a switch, let's go look at the actual perfmon log, the actual perfmon output. You'll notice here almost instantly right here, let me pause it and show you right here. This is what I call the inflection point. The weights start to go down significantly in this climb and the batches go up. This is at the point right here where we kind of start determining that the contention factor is high enough that we need to auto partition. 
And so if I let this graph still go and continue, you're going to see what happens. That the, the purple line here that are weights has dropped down to nothing, zero. The batches have increased to a much more steady rate than before, now up to almost 35, 3600. What's really significant is the processor time. It used to be up here in the 40s. It's now down at 15 and less than 20. This is a great example of scalability. We have reduced the contention, therefore increased the throughput of our batches, but we've also reduced the processor time. And the reason we've done that is the mechanism behind the scenes to protect these objects is spin locks. So spin locks have this crazy nature that the more contention on a spin lock, the higher your CPU, which is kind of opposite of what you'd normally think of a waiting scenario. Normally, if you're waiting on something, you don't see any CPU, but spin locks have that interesting nature. The higher the contention of spin lock, the more CPU. We have reduced that uh, uh, contention. Now, there's no spin lock CPU. The only CPU happening here is just the necessary time to process the memory allocations. So, cool example of a dynamic memory response that we're doing. If you go back to the DMV and you run this query again, you can actually see that it's ch changed now to be partitioned by CPU, which is the example of us doing this dynamically on the fly. Let me go ahead and stop that workload. So that's something you can kind of fun you can take a look at and run when you get to the demos. Let's start back where I was. Okay, let's move on and talk a little bit about parallel redo. A lot of things I talked about we do in parallel. And, and in the back of the deck you can see an example where we do parallel insert select. We still have obviously capabilities with parallel query. Well, one thing about redo we noticed, and if you've ever taken a look at how recovery works in SQL Server, I've got a link in there if you want to read more about it. We have three phases. We do analysis phase, we do redo phase, and undo phase. And the redo phase is interesting. That's where we're going through the transaction log and taking a look at pages that are on disk of the database where there's a transaction that's been committed in the log, but the page does not reflect that change. So in order to make sure we're consistent, we must take the transaction log entries for, that have been committed, and we must reapply or redo those changes on the page. And if you think about that process, it's all I.O. bound. The process is read the page from disk, go make the pages, uh, changes in the page itself. And we observed that with faster I.O. devices, uh, it was our redo code that was actually slowing down the space. No longer the bottleneck was the I.O. If the I.O. is so fast, like say less than a millisecond, it was our code that needed to actually get a bump improvement. And so, therefore, uh, we made changes to redo. And, in fact, one of the areas we saw this most was in secondary replicas because a secondary replica requires continuous redo operations. And if you know anything about synchronous secondary replicas for always on availability groups, you don't want to slow down the primary, right? So this idea of doing continuous redo has to be sped up. And if the I.O. is fast enough on the secondary, we've got to do something to drive the CPU harder. And so we said, why don't we do this in parallel? And here's kind of the visual concept of this. When we start up SQL Server for a given database, we will build up a worker pool. We'll use actually the standard SQL Server threading model from SQL OS. We'll dedicate a few of these uh, threads that we call the redo worker pool. And if you look at DM exec request, you'll actually see the command parallel redo task show up in, the, in this output. And then we go and map these tasks to something called the dirty page table. The dirty page table has existed always in SQL Server for recovery purposes. And it's a list of pages that we found during the analysis phase that need to be redone. These are the pages that need to be changed. But if we're going to do this in parallel, these pages might have been changed multiple times in multiple ways in the log. And we have to make sure that these changes are applied in the correct order that we've seen in the log. So what we do is we partition the dirty page table, there's that keyword again, partitioning, by page ID. And then we build a list of log sequence numbers in order that belong to each page in the table. Each task is then assigned a given page to work on and only that page. So a parallel redo task for page one will only work on page one values and then it'll go pick up another page. But notice that the other tasks don't touch page one changes. That way we're, we're assured that we will apply these changes in order for a page and everything's still consistent. And now we can attack this log in a way that's very interesting. Uh, all these tasks in parallel can just go go out there and redo pages as they need to and not have to worry about sequences because they only touch the changes for a given page. And hey, I've got a demo you can run afterwards. You can take this concept, you can apply an undocumented trace flag to disable parallel redo, then you can turn it back on again and try the same workload and you get an 80% boost and increase in performance from standalone recovery just because of this functionality. And again, notice what I just mentioned here, there's no changes for you, there's no configuration. This is just on by default. And when you run an always-on secondary replica, it's on by default as well. So 
an example of us making decisions to run things in parallel. Now, we don't use the degree of parallels and rules here to decide how many threads we run. We actually have some throttles on that. I believe the answer is like four per database that we do. Um, so we make decisions there that there's a, there's a, there's a uh, diminishing point of returns to go further on it, but it is still an example of using the same mechanism of parallelism with background threads behind the scenes to make recovery run faster. And if you think about the benefits, it's not just startup recovery, it's restore benefits for that well, and as I mentioned earlier, secondary replicas get a big boost in benefit. So a couple, couple examples of core engine scalability that we've done, other examples that exist back in the deck. So uh, how about CheckDB? I'm sure nobody in the phone cares about CheckDB. You, you don't really ever run that ever. Hey, common complaint and a common question from a customer as how long does CheckDB run? And my answer, unfortunately, has always been it takes as long as it takes, which is not a great answer people want to hear. Uh, so what the complaint has been to me is that as I get bigger and larger databases, even on scalable hardware, is CheckDB just takes way too long for me to run it. And so back in the 2008 time frame, I actually worked on some improvements with the product team to actually make uh, CheckDB run faster, and you can read about this in some of these links we have here to improve contention on a latch we call the multi-object scanner latch, which is something we need to coordinate the read of pages from a database across threads for multiple objects. And back in that time frame, uh, there was a benchmark that we tried to use when we looked at CheckDB, and we were trying to optimize, optimize CheckDB with physical only. That was the thing we were trying to go optimize. And the benchmark was to see how fast we could be to compare to, to back up to null. And by the way, that's not a typo, N-U-L there. It's not N-U-L-L. N-U-L in quotes is actually an old DOS trick. It's an actual name of a device, like a disk device, that behind the scenes, the Windows operating system says, that's a bit bucket. That's an empty device. So when backup runs, when, a backup, when you do a backup to null, a disk equals null, SQL Server will spawn a bunch of threads to read your pages from your database file and then not write the results. So what you're testing is how fast can SQL Server read pages from disk? Well, the same thing, the same thing con applies to CheckDB physical only. We're doing the same thing, so that was kind of our benchmark. How fast can physical only compare to this backup null test? So in 2008, we made some changes. We got close to that number, but we started realizing even a large database that wasn't enough. So in 16, we take it to a new level. We take this multi-object scanner latch, and we just simply got rid of it. Um, this is an interesting story. The developers that worked on in-memory OTP were very much used to the concept of what we call a no-lock approach, like no latches, no spin locks, no locks at all are needed. So they take a look at this problem and said, hey, we think we can change this multi-object scanner approach to a no-lock approach. It's all internal. You don't see the results, but you get the benefits from it. And the examples are the following. Like, We'll take a typical, what we call an SAP uh, database, which is a database with a ton of objects, at a one terabyte size, and just by going to 16, with using the same physical only check DB command, we can get a 7x uh, boost in performance. And the more degree of parallelism, the better, actually, because of this no-lock approach. There's a point of diminishing returns, but the, the, the results are amazing. And, and in, in fact, you can even take a small database of five gigabytes and see a 2x faster performance. I did that on my laptop. Uh, just because of the changes we actually made there. Uh, this is a chart that the developers gave me. And in this case, the bars, the bars here represent latency or performance, not based on uh, per performance speed. So the higher the bar, the worse. And you can see as you go across the right, as you would add more processors, this contention point gave you that reverse scalability problem. It would get worse. But with the no-lock approach, things get faster or even the same as you go across processors. So again, potentially 7x faster performance running CheckDB physical only. A full check, a full CheckDB could benefit some from this, but the, but the performance benefits will be less because uh, there are more things, of course, for full CheckDB to do than just do a read of the pages. And there's another slide at the back of the deck that talks about some performance enhancements we made in 16 for extended logical checks. So you can take a look at that as well uh, afterwards. Now, how about TempDB? Certainly a passionate topic for many of you listening on the phone right now, and it's been something that I think over the history of my career has been one of the most debated hot topics I've ever ran into before. And back in 2011, I've got a link here on the slide, I did a talk at the past summit on TempDB. And one of the things I try to dispel is a myth that you need to have one file per CPU on your machine. I just didn't believe that ever. So I did some tests to actually prove that that wasn't the case, and you can see more about it in the talk. But I'm going to show you a slide in a second that shows those results again. And if you think about how many files you need for TempDB, you know, some people actually think that that's an I.O. problem, and that's really not it. Sure, you can actually take your files for TempDB and spread them across drives, 
and when we have to write to TempDB, temp that could boost performance. But when you're talking about files for TempDB, and we're talking about multiple files here, um, usually the consideration is about allocation. And it's about access to these pages called GAM, SGAM, and PFS. In effect, when you create a file uh, per CPU up to a certain number, you are partitioning you are partitioning the threads that have to allocate pages. Because when you use tempdb, that's typically what you're doing. You're creating and dropping temp objects a lot and filling data in there. So for the most part, what you end up doing is you're really hitting really hard allocation structures like GAM, SGAN, and PFS. So by creating multiple files, you're partitioning out that work to make it more scalable. And my behavior that I found before is that one file per CPU up to eight usually makes a lot of sense, and then pass that add four until you don't see any benefits anymore. Usually though, on really large CPU systems, let's say you've got 128 CPUs, I've rarely seen 128 files make that big of a difference. And in 16, we did a couple of things. Number one, by default, we added and made some changes for tempdb, and then you see here in this uh, picture of my slide, we added a tab for setup to make it better. So in tempdb, by default, we'll have one, per, uh, one file per logical CPU up to eight, or you can increase it. We changed the auto grow to a, a PFS interval to be 64 to make it more efficient on, on how we're actually auto growing tempdb. You can actually spread your files across drives, and the transaction log is now eight. It is conceivable that these defaults, maybe, maybe the size is something you might want to change, right? But it's conceivable these defaults actually could serve well for many, many workloads. So what you see these numbers on the screen are the defaults for 16, but then you can configure these in tempdb. And just like you can do it with anything else in setup, you actually have uh, um, options within the configuration files to make these changes as well. And so does it really matter? Well, it does. Look at this chart on the left. This is a chart that I presented back in 2011, and I dusted off that, that demo and ran it again. And you can see, if just by going from one file to eight files, the difference in performance. This is the number of seconds that it took to run this workload. And you see the drop in the time it took to run just by going to eight files. And then you can see, you go to 32 and 64, you start seeing a diminishing point of returns. And on the right, you can see the performance benefits I got for my small little laptop here. I've got a laptop with one CPU, four coarse hyperthreads, so eight CPUs. And I just ran this benchmark, this little demo that you, got, you have access access to, you can run later, and look, 2x performance uh, on my laptop. Now, in the back of the deck is also a discussion of trace flags. These trace flags you might have heard before, trace flag 1118, trace flag 1117, those are on by default now as well. You don't even have to turn those on. In fact, if you do turn them on, the error log kind of warns you and says, by the way, these trace flags don't matter anymore. You don't need them. And there's a slide in the back of the deck where you can take a look at that. So again, 2x faster performance out of the box on an 8 CPU machine, no changes. Now, it's true that you could have configured TempDB to be very quick on your environment, but what if you actually migrate to a new version of SQL and forget to make those changes? This is why one of the benefits of 16 is like, it's kind of like a, it just works mentality. You don't have to worry about it anymore. So it's about TempDB. Uh, I.O. is another area we've made faster. Uh, we've made significant changes here in I.O. In fact, there's a lot of slides in the back on the I.O. section, pretty detailed changes we've made to I.O. Here's a couple to consider. Instant file initialization is a concept that's been around since 2005, and I'll explain in a second a small little change we made to make your life better here. But I thought it'd be interesting to make sure you understand what this technology does. Prior to having this technology, <clears throat> the speed to create a database was the speed to write zeros to disk. But Windows came along with an API call that allows SQL Server to tell Windows, hey, give me a 10 gig file. And Windows comes back with a snap of your finger and says, okay, you got a 10 gig file, without having to write zeros to the file. Now, here's the interesting part. Uh, the interesting part is, is that when you use this API call for Windows, SQL Server, uh, which if you have this privileged performance volume maintenance task, it doesn't need to know that those zeros are on this disk, but anybody else that doesn't have that privilege would actually see zeros. So the way Windows achieves this is that it just reserves the space on disk for you in the NTFS system, but it doesn't zero the file. And SQL doesn't worry about it either, because SQL comes along later, and as it, it initializes pages, it, can, it zeroes things and initializes as it comes along and formats pages. So it doesn't have to write zeros to disk. Now, for a create database, you probably don't care. I don't care if it takes ten, you know, five minutes to create a 10 gig file. I'll go get a cup of coffee. But you do care about restore. It, restore is something that has to do the same process like you're creating a database. So you want that to be very fast and you especially care about auto-grow. If you auto-grow occurs on a database file, and it takes five minutes to auto-grow a database file because of transaction, you're going to block the world. So those are very significant operations that you do care about, and you want to make sure you use this functionality. 
As I said, it does require the performance volume maintenance task privilege. I mean, who can even remember the name of that thing? It doesn't even line up with what the, what the feature is called. Uh, and you need to know that for the transaction log, um, we do rely on our own byte pattern, so we can't use this functionality. But again, as I mentioned, nobody knows this privilege. Nobody remembers it. Who can even remember what program you have to run on Windows to actually enable it? I can't. So in setup for SQL 16, we put a handy little checkbox right under the service accounts when you're running setup that you just check it on, and we will then enable the privilege for the service account for SQL Server at that point going forward. And in fact, if you use our new installer, which I encourage you to check out, which works for Evaluation Express and Developer Editions, you know, point and click, three screens, you're done installing SQL, by default we will actually turn on this functionality. It's something that a lot of people, I think, forget and don't realize that they should be using, uh, but it really can save your time, especially when it comes to restore and auto-grow scenarios. 200% faster. I mean, I can take a simple, you can try it. Go try to create a 10 gig file on your laptop with SQL Server. Don't have this privilege turned on and watch your screen sit there and sit in Management Studio. Then go turn around and do the same thing and turn it on and it comes back so fast you don't even know you'd already click, click the button. So, and here's the point, creating a file for a database is almost the same speed regardless of the size. The, the size it takes to create a 100 meg database versus a 10 or 100 gig database is almost the same with a couple other things we have to do behind the scenes because of using this functionality. Here's an example called persisted log buffer of something that is actually a good example of not, not just us reacting to hardware changes in the market, but us actually staying ahead of hardware changes in the market. So if you think about the evolution of storage, you know, hard drive systems uh, typically had latencies in terms of milliseconds, so I've got the word MS next to it. But the latency was more like seven milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, things of that nature. If you, look at, if you think of early SSD drives, that number dropped down to one or two or three. Along comes these things called PCI NVMe SSD drives. In fact, I have one on the laptop I'm doing this presentation on. And if you ever look at one of these things, I encourage you to look at them. They look like memory cards, like little memory sticks. I've actually popped up my laptop and looked at it. It looks like a memory bank, right? But it's actually a drive. And the symbol next to it is microseconds. So now the typical latency or the performance of using these drives is actually less than a millisecond. Um, so using them can be pretty significant for you. Well, there's even a newer technology that's faster than that. It's something called NVDIMM. And on the slide right here, the, the name for this is called persistent memory, and there's a very good reason for that. These things run at the speed, nanosecond speed, of memory. So imagine now having I.O. at the speed of memory. Now, they're pretty small in size nowadays. Windows Server 2016 does support a, a normal I.O. path to use them. But what's special that Windows 16 now supports is something called direct access, or DAX. And SQL Server 2016 SP1 can take advantage of this technology. So consider this scenario. You get one of these uh, pieces of hardware from a vendor. Uh, they're typically today about 8 gig in size. And you're thinking, well, that's pretty small. I can't fit my log on that thing. Well, you don't have to. So consider this. You format an NTFS volume in Windows using a special DAX parameter on one of these new drives that's 8 gig in size. You create your transaction log, let's say, on an SSD drive. Maybe that's 100 gig in size or 500 gig in size. If in SP1 you create a second log file using alter database or even during your create database command, you put that log file on this new type of drive you format with DAX, SQL Server auto recognizes that and it will take the log cache in memory and it will copy the log cache over to this new drive so that the speed of commits accelerated greatly. In fact, when we've tested this, write log weights which show up in DM exec requests show up as zero. But it's not a bug in our code, it's because the speed and the latency of these write log weights are now less than a millisecond. So it's kind of ironic that you'll be running around looking at weight, weights and you'll see zero show up and you're like, hey, what's wrong here? Why, why am I getting a weight of zero? Well, you're actually not getting a weight of zero. You're getting a, a, a weight of less than a millisecond granularity, more on the microsecond level or even potentially nanosecond level, and therefore our, our granularity of our DMV doesn't even work anymore. So we've got to make a change for that, right? We're so fast, the DMVs can't keep up. There's some videos that talk about how this actually works, and there's a very detailed doc, blog post by Kevin Farley and the engine team about the specifics of this, how the technology works, and how you can take advantage of it. So take a look at NVDIM. If you're concerned about the latency of transaction logs in your environment and speeding up your OTP application, especially with in-memory OTP, this could be a significant change and a game changer for you. And I've seen 2x speeds performance over using even this fast PCI SSD drive I have on my laptop uh, just by using this technology. Well, available now in Windows Server 2016 and SQL Server 2016 SP1. 
I don't know if any of the phone here use spatial technologies ever, uh, but, but we have seen an increase in customers trying to use spatial data types in SQL Server. And spatial data types have a couple of properties. Number one, a spatial data type actually can be used in a client application through a CLR assembly called Microsoft SQL Server Types for client apps. And you would use a type called SQL Geography. Or in SQL Server, you can use a data type called T-SQL called a Geography or Geometry. Those are built-in native data types that behind the scenes we implement uh, with some SQL CLR assemblies and a native DLL. When I say native DLL, I mean a non uh, CLR DLL, something just written in C or C++. So SQL 16 changes the way we do things a little bit for a very good reason. So if you look here in SQL 14, the way you have to access this geography or geometry data type methods is behind the scenes we have to call a SQL CLR assembly, the same one using these client apps, and then we then must turn around and go call this native DLL called SQL Server Spatial something, some version number, and this transition is called p-invoke between the two. Well, if you're just processing a couple of hundred rows for spatial types, it's no big deal. But these customers that were coming to us were saying, hey, I'm processing millions of data points when I'm doing this, and I just don't think I'm getting the performance I should get. And in fact, I'm noticing a large number of CPU that gets chewed up by doing this. Well, at first we thought, well, you know, high CPU, spatial calculations, it's all just math. That's probably the same. But as we looked at our code and used some of those instruments I talked about to figure out the problem, we noticed that this P invoke transition is very expensive when it comes to millions and millions of transitions and rows. So in SQL 16, we just simply changed the code path. You make no changes to your T-SQL code. Behind the scenes, when we access these things, we will contact this native DLL in a different way. We will actually use our own native SQL Lang DLL, which is a DLL we use for the SQL engine, and we will implement the same type of code implemented in SQL CLR will only do it in a native way, therefore bypassing this p-invoke process. It doesn't mean that SQL CLR is not performant or this managed type is not performant, but for us to do this transition between the spatial and the managed all the time to get the maximum performance for spatial data types, we must go to this completely native type process. And the results are real. I mean, these are just examples on the slide right here. If you look at the left-hand side, these are actual examples of real customers that have benefited from this technology. Oil companies, designers, insurance companies, environmental protection companies looking at spills, um, catastrophic risk modeling, shipping companies. We've seen all sorts of examples of customers that need spatial data types for either geometry or geography type operations inside SQL Server that have gotten some amazing type results. Uh, so I thought I would, uh, for a second, just show you a quick little example of a demo that sees this. So make sure I've got this set up right here. Yeah, this is a script you get when you look at the demos to look at a spatial data type. And you might find this interesting. This is a geometry line string of data points. And these data points aren't just made up. This actually comes from data points from the Sandy Hurricane uh, uh, storm that happened years ago. And a company reached out to us and said, hey, we've got to do some analysis of the floodplain that surrounds areas affected by the Sandy Hurricane and our queries are taking way too long using these geometry data types. And again, and if you actually do run this on SQL Server and you, you kick this off, you'll see the clock over here for the amount of time it takes. This takes like 20 seconds to actually go run this thing. So this is an example where we turned on this native implementation 2016 and we're using this trace flag to actually show you the difference between doing it natively and not natively. So I'll go over here to this window where I've got this trace flag running and I'll show you how fast this takes. In fact, it's so fast, as you can see, it just comes back, and it's less than a millisecond. Now, just to demonstrate to you guys how serious we are about our upcoming announcements, if you look closely over here and you scroll over on the ad ad version for this technology, you notice here that I'm actually running this on Ubuntu. So this is an example behind the scenes where I'm taking native, uh, the SQL Server spatial technologies, and I'm actually uh, querying against a virtual machine on my laptop that's running SQL Server on Linux. Um, so no change. Just to my app, I just connected the SQL Linux. I got the same performance boosts as you see on 16 uh, if you're running actually on Windows. And again, the, the, the demo looks kind of contrite. Like, how cool is that demo? Well, actually, it's based on real data, and it, it, it really matters to this customer that this geometry line string, uh, and this is basically plotting a, a line string across these map data points into a visual way that you saw the difference there. 20 seconds, uh, and with our our changes in 16 that we made, which is also available on Linux, you see that's down to zero milliseconds. So an incredible 200x boost in performance just by seeing the changes we made and no changes to the T-SQL script itself. 
enhanced. So kind of a cool little demo. And there's other uh, enhancements to spatial that we've seen. Uh, there in back of the deck, you can see to spatial indexes as well, which is an important thing customers need when using spatial queries. So let's end our session today talking a little bit about always on availability groups. Uh, certainly an important topic to a lot of people uh, and something that I think that we've done a lot of good work on. And so the mindset for you on the phone is that in SQL 2012 and 14, we introduced this concept called always on availability groups as a new uh, way of doing uh, high availability from what we have with database mirroring. And so, you know, we thought we did a pretty good job with the algorithms and the design, the architecture we built. And, and certainly in the early days of 12 and 14, that, that was the case. We were seeing that with customers. Customers liked the functionality. But here's what happened. Customers, and here's that theme again about hardware, customers said, look, I want better scalability on this whole system. So I'm going to take my secondaries. I already got great hardware on my primary. But on my secondaries, I'm going to put really fast disk systems. I'm going to put high core CPU systems because I want that to be fast as well. Well, here's what we observe. Customers in the environments would all of a sudden get a performance drop or reverse scalability when they use these replicas in a synchronous way. So it was really depressing. I mean, customers would tell us, hey, I've got a standalone workload, one and I'm not using an AG, and I would get X performance. Then I would simply configure always on availability groups for a synchronous replicary on a really high-end system on the secondary and performance would go way down in the primary. Because if you think about a synchronous scenario, remember, the transaction can't be committed on the primary until the log is hardened on both systems. So we said, okay, it's got to be a problem with the hardware. It's got to be something. It's not us, right? Well, we found out that's not the case. We found out that in some cases it was our code that was actually the bottleneck in these high performance scenarios uh, and not the actual configuration environment from the customer. And and we have other factors that kind of pushed us to really rethink this. In-memory OTP, of course, is a technology that's amazingly fast, but it's only as good as how fast the transaction log is. So even if I use the persistent log buffers on my primary, if my secondary is really slow and I'm using in OTP, my in OTP transactions can't be fast and they commit. So we need to make sure that's really, really fast. And behind the scenes for Azure SQL Database, we use our AG technologies. That's got to be fast too. So we take a, took a look at this and said, during the 16 design time frame, let's put some hard fact goals in place. Let's put some goals that make it really clear and intentional that we mean business. So one goal was, we'll take a standalone workload and say, we must be at least 95% as fast as that workload for a single sync replica, provided that the hardware is not the bottleneck. So in other words, if you've got a system and your hardware is fast, and it's not the problem, it's not the network speed between the machines, it's not the I.O. on both the drives, it's not the CPUs, it's just SQL Server, we've got to be at least 95% as fast as a standalone workload. This hater sync commit that you see in the second box there is a wait type, that if you see high wait times there, that's an indication that we potentially have a latency going on on the secondary. So again, we need to make sure that that wait type shows up as something that's really not an issue for latency. So here's kind of an overview of what we did. We, we took a look at the code and said, hey, you know what it takes? It takes 15 worker thread context switches just to go from the primary to the secondary and back to the primary to ship a log block. Well, that seems a little bit too much. We didn't notice this before because IO systems out there were usually the bottleneck and not us. So we reduced that code down to 8, 10 with encryption. We improved how things work in the communication path. We put pool of communication workers together. We even allow a fast path for log writer to go directly to the network. And we can stream log blocks in parallel. I, I mentioned even earlier in the call about the concept of multiple log writers. We introduced multiple log writers on the primary and secondary. We saw a boost in performance there. Remember I mentioned parallel log redo? Well, that comes into play here as well. Parallel log redo on the secondary allows us to keep up with continuous redo and do it faster. And then we just simply went into the code and said, hey, let's use some of our instrumentation capabilities with things like XPerf and say, where is all the CPU being consumed during these operations? So in some cases, there were spin locks. We went to the no lock approach. In some areas, it was algorithms that just hadn't been updated that could actually be optimized and run faster. And I'm proud to show you today the results. And if you've got, uh, when you get this deck later, if you click on this hyperlink here, this goes to a detailed blog post that talks more about these results. Look at the chart on the right. If you look at the blue line, the blue line represents the speed of a standalone workload. You have number of users, concurrent users on the, on the x-axis. You have log throughput on the primary and the y-axis. And you can see as you increase users, you start getting better performance with the blue. Now look at the yellow. The yellow line represents SQL 2014 performance using a single sync replica. As you can see, the gap between the yellow and the blue is, is actually quite embarrassing. It's not very good, right? But look at the orange. 
The orange represents SQL Server 2016. And in fact, if you actually take these numbers, you will see it is 95% uh, difference. So the orange is running at 95%, and the gray is encrypt with encryption. So if you look at the left, you can see our results. For a single sync replica, 95%, 90% with two replicas. With encryption, 90% of standalone, 85% of two replicas. And these commit latencies we talked about are indeed less than a millisecond. And I even listed for you the general specs of the hardware we used. We didn't pick the fastest machine on earth to actually do this. Uh, this is actually a fairly reasonable server that can actually be purchased today to run this technology. And the message for you is this. It is possible to get these speeds with always on availability groups provided that you put in the right hardware specs both on your primary and secondary machines. So take a look at that blog post. I'm pretty excited about what we've done here. Always, there, there shouldn't be any more a scenario uh, where customers are so worried about putting in a single sync replica and always on because of performance on their primaries being affected uh, by SQL Server. So we have more things that we've actually blogged about that we're not going to actually uh, go over today, but we have more stuff that we're going to blog about. Uh, I should say brag about. Um, this is interesting. Internally, we actually have some notes that we've taken about the research we did during the design of 16, about some things that are kind of hidden and not seen by a lot of people uh, that we really haven't actually documented that we're going to continue to doc about, uh, document here in this series. So look for more blog posts on our Bob SQL blog. Uh, we're definitely going to go talk more about this, uh, these features we've done and continue to iterate and get the word out of things we've actually done in SQL Server to make it faster. As I've mentioned before to you, we have our blog post. Uh, this is an actual shortcut to, to get just to the blog post themselves. But if you, again, if you just uh, do a search on Bob SQL uh, in your favorite search engine, I think you'll easily hit our blog and see our tags that we have for this series of blog posts. The second bullet point is some great blog posts that the SQL Cat team has done. In some cases, they match and provide more details of some of the things that we've talked about. But in some cases, they also talk about features in SQL Server 2016 that are not related to the topic we're talking about today, but are interesting for you to understand why 16 may be a great value proposition for you. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, there's bonus material. Uh, and in fact, it's kind of insane. There's like uh, 12 slides back here in the back of this deck or more. Uh, so I tried to make sure that every blog post uh, that we had done on this topic has a corresponding slide that you can take and read about uh, later. So. Wow, what a, what a lightning round <laughs> of information to, to cram in your brain today. And really what I hope you, you got a feel for of what's possible. Uh, and what's possible is, is that you can take an application on a previous version of SQL Server. You can move to SQL 16, and with almost no changes to your app, you're going to see a performance boost from many things we've done in the core engine uh, for enhancements to SQL performance. And our intention was to make sure that the changes you have to make would be very minimized to see that kind of boost in performance. So thank you so much for being here today. Uh, Leslie, thank you so much for, for inviting me. I look forward to coming back for other type of, uh, of topics. Again, uh, you know, they're going to make the recording available to you. The decks and demos are already out there. Uh, I'm sure you've generated a ton of questions, and I really like to answering questions. So when we collect all of those, I'm committed to getting a blog post. I'm also committed to answering interview emails at bobward at microsoft.com. Leslie, thank you so much. I had a great time presenting us today. Thanks, Bob. Um, lots of good, good information and very exciting for this. So again, I'm going to give everybody just a couple minutes if you guys have questions to go ahead and type that in. Um, and then we will get that list generated and sent to Bob, and he'll follow up on that. And then um, the slide deck, if you cannot find it, I'll try to get that from Bob and get that posted on our, our meeting archive also. Um, Absolutely. We're committed to getting you this inf information. We want fantastic. you to have Fantastic. So we'll get that yeah. slide deck available on the virtual performance chapter, and um, hopefully you all have a fantastic and safe December. Bob, enjoy your Christmas. Thank you. You as well. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.